The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This series is brought to you by Hub24, one of Australia's leading providers of integrated platform, technology and data solutions to the wealth industry. By working with licensees and advisors, Hub24 is delivering innovative solutions and service excellence that enables you to do business your way, creating efficiencies for your business and value for your clients. These are just some of the reasons why advisors have rated Hub24 number one for value for money and best managed portfolio functionality six years running, empowering better financial futures together. Find out more at hub24.com.au. What does success mean? What are the markers or the hallmarks of success for us in our world? Is it that you run your own business, that you have lots of referrals and lots of client opportunities? Is it that you're innovating and doing something that no one else is really doing well? Is it that you're winning awards, big awards? Well, what if you do all of those things and it doesn't feel right? It isn't gonna work. It isn't sustainable. Have you failed? What is it to fail? I'm talking to Charlie Fraser this week. Now, we talk a lot about all of the things that I've just mentioned. The fact that we put all of these external markers of success at the forefront of our mind and we tell ourselves stories that often are really untrue. We're going to cover a pretty raw and real chat today about Charlie's journey through a large institution to jump out into his own business and realizing, actually, this isn't going to work. What did that feel like? Did he, in fact, fail? And where is he at now? Enjoy. Hi, Charlie. Hey, Jess. Are you ready for today's chat? I am ready. I think we're going to have a chat that is quite unusual, actually, because you've done, I would say your story is really unique, which we're going to get into, and you've done what is the opposite to what most people do. So rather than me keep being cryptic, why don't don't I hand over to you for further context? Charlie, let's talk a little bit about your story And then I've got many, many questions that flow from that. But for people who don't know you, let's rock and roll. Who are you, Charlie, and what's your story? Uh, It's profoundly disinteresting, but I hope I can make it mildly interesting (laughs) for you. Um, So I guess we pick pick up the story. You know, I fell into financial advice, as most people did, working for a Mm. bank, wanted to do more for people, found it really interesting, ended up doing financial advice within one of the big banks for I don't know, five or so years, which I enjoyed, but then started to look for a little bit more and then ended up at uh, one of the private wealth divisions of a trustee company, which I Mm -hmm. was there for a few years and then ended up just really just through uh, serendipity as much as anything else working with, for the trustee company, working with people that didn't have capacity to look after their own financial affairs and did that for quite a few years and we built built a big practice in that, which which was quite rewarding. And I and I loved it, uh, but circa 2015, I think I'd been there for about 11 years, and it was just I don't know, it was just probably just time for a change for me. And also, what I felt was in my work, I felt that sometimes we were solving for the wrong problems. In that I had a financial background, the it worked with a big team, and they a lot of them had a legal background and a trust background. Whereas for our clients who were dealing with people with catastrophic injuries, and we were dealing with the families, they needed help with day to day life. They needed help with well being. They needed support. And mm-hmm. I just so often felt that I had a lot of empathy for the people that I was dealing with, but I just didn't have the tools to help them. And ultimately, in 2015, I just just decided 
look, I think it's probably time for me to make a change and mm. left that role really not with any strong sense of what it was that I wanted to do other than I think we might be able to do this a little bit differently. And mm-hmm. so quite, if I'm being frank, probably quite naively ended up in my own business. And really the reason for that was I came up with a, a business model which was ultimately combining well-being services with financial services and then taking a step away from the so still focusing on the compensation work but taking a step away from the trustee company and then working alongside a trustee company as a separate financial advisor and the idea then would be we have a what we what we called at the time a role which was a well-being advocate who would be the the friendly face for the client had a disability or health advocacy background and could actually get into the trenches with them and help them with their lives on a day-by-day basis that then translates into financial needs and then we can provide the advice from there and and so the reason I ultimately went out on my own was because all the firms that I spoke to when I left my previous firm, they were really interested in us from a new business point of view because I had a pretty good track record of, of new client acquisition. And they were very interested in that. But when yeah. it came to the support we needed and when it came to the model, this wellbeing model that we're putting together, the, the interest was was dulled because it just didn't really fit into anybody's model. And so it, yeah. it really just got to a point where I thought, well, if we're going to do this, I'll have to, I have to do it by myself. And... Mm-hmm. And so then really just hurtled down the road of self-employment, licensing, all the things of which I really had no, not to say no idea about, but was quite green in. And six months later, we had a, had a business set up. We opened the doors and, and look, we were remarkably successful. We went from a standing start with zero clients to an operating profit in nine months, I think, and mm. which, was, which was wonderful. Mm. Um, but we did become a bit of a victim of our own success to a point in that we grew much faster than my processes could grow with it. And and also, I just from a personal point of view, just being self-employed just didn't, didn't sit well with me. You got very used to, and I'm sure anyone who's self-employed would understand, you just got very used to not sleeping, got very used to worrying about everything all of the time. And yeah. so so there was a bit of a confluence where, when you alluded to earlier, where I've done things a little bit differently to a lot of people, there was a confluence where, from a personal point of view, it probably wasn't working for me. Um, from a business point of view, it was going well, but I wasn't getting paid yet. And because I hadn't intended to really set up my own business, I just I didn't have a really big war chest. And I hadn't been, to be frank, very sensible in the way that I'd managed my cash flow either, because I almost didn't want to didn't want to acknowledge that. And then I had some hit some structural issues with my business as well, and so all of those things came together. And I thought, okay, as much as I love this, and I love the brand, and I love what we've built, and people have really bought into this. It was a business was called Lindhurst. They built bought into that Lindhurst family, as we called it. It just wasn't right, and so then you know, that decision was made where we had to had to make a change. It's so interesting because, I, you know, I resonate deeply having come from the big end of town and then, you know, sometimes it can feel really constrictive to not be able to build something that you see is so glaringly obviously needed. And then you take that leap of faith and you start a business and you're, the sheer level of overwhelm is really hard to describe if you've never been there. I think it might be like having a baby. Like you can read all about it all you like, but until you actually have one, it's completely, I say this without a baby, but I'd imagine (laughs) it's quite similar. Um, Charlie, let's talk about that conflict because externally you're doing really well. The business is doing really well from, you know, all of the the measures that people can see. You're, You're innovating and bringing something into advice that is really market leading. You're winning awards, which I want to talk about in a little bit. But you're not sleeping, you're really stressed, and you're not taking an income. At what point in this journey, because that's a huge conflict where everything looks great and things are stressful at the same time, at what point or was there something that happened where you went, nah, this is not going to be how we survive the next 5, 10, 15 years? Like how did it get to the point where you were like, I need an alternate option? Yeah, and I think it was a, it was a confluence of events. It was 
firstly, it was from a business point of view, we I had something which it happened which which structurally affected our practice, and so I'll talk to you about that briefly. And what it was was so a lot of the work that I got then and still get, where you you receive a referral for a client for a potential client from a personal injury lawyer for someone who has received typically a large sum of money and quite mm-hmm. commonly they don't have capacity to manage their money so they need a trustee. And the business yeah. model that we'd set up was the solicitor would refer that work to me and then mm-hmm. I would I had a couple of different trustee companies that I had relationships with and I would then go and talk to the trustee companies and then we would find the most appropriate one for the client and then ultimately the trustee company would appoint me as the advisor. But the way okay. we'd set up our model was we we had the primary relationship with the client because we had the wellbeing services and so we thought that was a pretty good model. And I had an issue where a barrister, we had a, a family down the Gold Coast, lovely family, little girl, I think she might have been five, had cerebral palsy, had received a lot of money and from a solicitor I'd known for a really long time fantastic relationship with the family everything was going really well and then the solicitor rang me and she said look we have a problem she said because the barrister has said that he doesn't feel comfortable getting up in front of a judge and getting this what they call sanctioned so getting the court to stamp the appointment and what she explained to me was that she said the issue that the barrister had with has with this is even though it's the trustee company that's being appointed by the court that's not who the clients are appointing in their mind the clients are in their mind are appointing you mm. and there's two issues well the main issue with that is this go this child needs somebody to support them for potentially 80 years and yes there's a trustee company there but ultimately they're putting all of their faith in you and you being able to deliver that is is relying upon you being able to get out of bed every day and so we consequently didn't win that client and and that was a bit of a fork in the road for me from a business point of view because from a personal point of view, as I said before, it probably wasn't working. And when I went home and I had a chat with my wife about what had happened and and she had some interesting contact because part of the reason for setting up the business is her. She had a twin – her twin brother had severe cerebral palsy, which is where the sort of the idea for the business came from. And she just said, well, what, what would we do? She said, if that was our child, what would we do? Would we put our faith in a one-man band? She said, the answer is no. She said, it doesn't matter how good your practice is, you can't get over that. That's that's a glare. And now, and, and her point, which was the right one, she said, now, now that you know it, you can't get over it either. Mm. And so I rang a mentor of mine who is a lovely fellow and he just said, look, you've got a great business. And he's pretty frank, so I won't use the exact words he used, but he said, you've got a great business, but you're structurally challenged. Let's say he said that. I endorse swearing, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> And so, I mean, when you were telling me what the barrister said, if you really step back, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does. It does. And whilst we're talking about this as a niche, what you do is quite niche. For the majority of people who are listening, particularly those who, who run really tiny businesses, it's probably a really interesting point for advised clients more broadly because the age of a financial advisor is not young. Uh, and I think that this concept probably rolls through the, the, the mind of many people who want to get advice. Like, are you going to be there for me Mm. or who's going to be there for me? Where, what happens to your clients? And the level of proactivity in that conversation is probably quite low because for the majority of one man bands that I know, they don't have succession sorted. And so that creates enormous challenges when something does happen. So yes, I appreciate that this is quite a niche component as to why that barrister said no, but I think it speaks volumes to challenges that many other advisors would face just in a different sort of way. I think that's you're precisely right. I think it's it's for the if I can put if I can say this the normal financial advice market, it's it's wouldn't be something that's articulated in that way and that most people aren't making 50 year decisions when they appoint an advisor they, mm. they possibly are but then maybe not thinking about it that way mm. but yeah it's it's it is a key issue and it was one that i had to face pretty starkly and also then the, as i said it being a confluence of events it was at that point where my wife also sat me down and she said look my support for you going into this practice was contingent upon two things one was that you don't 
that we see you, that you don't work 80 hours a week. And mm-hmm. the other one is, is that you don't risk our house. And she said, you know, the business is tracking along pretty well. But if this is the structural issue that you're coming up against, then that means your new business acquisition could possibly be affected because the barrister involved was one of the most influential barristers in Queensland. So I knew that I had a problem. And she said, and also, and her words were, she said, this business needs 80 hours a week. And she said, and you don't have it in you because it's just not that important to you. She said, you know, your family and your life and your kids are, are too important to you to give the time to the business that it needs. And she said, so you just, we just need to say that just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. And so that was really, that was the day. And it was the next day that I started the process of, okay, well, how do I, where to? What do I do now? Was this at the time when you were also advisor of the year? It was at the time I was going through the process of being considered for it. Because you won that. Yes, I did. Congrats. Obviously, congrats. That's an um, extraordinarily robust and thorough process. So to win that speaks that it well. Is. <laughs> it is. It is. Um, I say this not because I've done it, but because I was part of the judging process. Uh, you were. Which Charlie was involved in. And so I did a huge amount of deep diving into all of the businesses. So I feel like I know a little bit about uh, what that looks like. So you've got this interesting situation where externally – you're, you're killing it. Let's just say that. Your partner's saying this is not viable. Your largest, ref- a huge referral opportunity has noted that something is, is really wrong. And you are then convinced that you have to make a change. Was being advisor of the year or being on a pedestal, did that influence, what impact did that have? It may have had no impact at all, but did it, did it make you feel like you had to do a certain thing? Or behave a certain way. I don't know if I'm making making sense at all. No, you are making sense. I think it cre- obviously created a conflict in my mind um, because by the time I won the award, I had moved to the firm that I'm now with, and so there was an element of okay, well, I've won this award based on a based on a business that I no, that I no longer operate. The service hadn't changed, so I didn't feel any issue in relation to that. But the thing though that it did do was. Because we hadn't been operating the business that long, really, when I won that award. So the the thing that I – the positive I took from it was that what it was was it was proof of concept for me, mm. which is to go, you know what, I'd be right to keep this business going. I'd be right to prove it out. I'd be right to you know, build all these clients and push on and kill myself doing it and build a great, a great business, which would be a wonderful representation of my ego. Mm. But – you know, you can be right or you can be successful and happy. Quite often you can't be both. And so what it did do for me was to say, it's enough. Um, you know, it's it's like that's an amazing recognition really for something that was just inside my head. And yeah. And so you just have to satisfy yourself when you go, look, it's not perfect, but it's enough. The level of vulnerability required to acknowledge that pushing through is based on ego is huge. And we all have an ego. We should have an ego, but how big we let that ego inflate obviously mm. is our choice and obviously yep. has really large consequences. And um, I think that that point that you just made around whether you are right or successful and happy, it's a really, it's a really important point for many of us to ponder. But I also want to throw something in the mix because this didn't feel good, <laughs> no, right? It didn't. Let's talk about that. You say to me that when you made this decision for a really long time, you felt in some ways like you'd failed. Yep. Yep. Why? Well, I think by it depends on the lens which with with which you look at it. By any mm. conventional measure, if you don't understand the context, then you look at it and you go, "Okay, well, this guy's left a big insto. He's gone out on his own. The business has folded within however long, and now he's back at a big insto." So. You know, by most objective measures, that's failure, isn't it? The business has failed. Like I've still got a beautiful capital loss from my business that I can carry forward. <laughs> so by every objective measure, it's a failure. And and so that's 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 what you take with you. Um, mm. But that's the but that's the price as well. And when you felt like this, did you do anything that was a bit weird? Like 
I want to understand from a mental health perspective, like how significantly did this impact you? Oh, that's a and it's a good question. I don't know. Like I'm, I am one of those pe- people whose mind is going all the time, mm. and it is that you know, the, as they say, the thing that makes you strong makes you weak. The thing that makes me strong is is that you constantly question whether you're working hard enough, a good enough friend, good enough dad, good enough parent, sorry, good enough husband, all that stuff. Like you always question. I always question that every single minute, and that makes me. I don't know successful is probably a, it's just an objective term, but it makes me good at certain things, but it also makes you weak because you're constantly questioning yourself, and mm. it can be it can be quite difficult to just. I admire people who can just make a decision, rule a line under it, and move forward. Um, maybe they don't exist. Maybe they just pretend. Um, but it was, and the people I really struggled with. So I lost contact with quite a few people for a while, um, but they were, and they were the people who were in business themselves or people who were partners in accounting firms. So the people who were taking the risk that I'd walked away from and they were the people I not avoided. No, avoided is actually the right word. I did avoid them. I'm like, yeah, you lost contact. Let's let's call a spade a spade. You probably proactively chose to not be around those people. Is that a fair comment? Absolutely. Because they were doing it and you were no longer doing it. Yeah, yeah. And so it was that. I was making the decision for them as to how they were viewing me. Hmm. And so it's that took years, years. Did it? Yeah. And it wasn't until I felt completely comfortable where I am now with Shadforth. It wasn't really until I felt comfortable there where I always knew that moving here, I always knew logically that it was the right thing to do on every single aspect of of my life and in my practice. I know that. But it takes a while to convince yourself emotionally that it was the right thing to do. So you've built this story that I have failed, that this is shameful, that I can't be around those people who are doing the thing that I couldn't do or didn't do or wouldn't stick around to do. And that's keeping you or, you know, surrounding your thoughts over and over again, because you sound like an overthinker. I am not an overthinker. So I'd love to learn from you and you can probably learn from me. That's a really big spiral when you're trying to lift processes into a new place, when you're trying to move people to somewhere new and tell them everything's going to be okay and that it's the same thing. You know, I I find it fascinating that we put an enormous amount of pressure on ourselves, more than we would ever expect other people to shoulder. We are hypercritical of things that don't work out well because we tell ourselves that failure is ultimate and that it's the cliff and that you can never come back rather than a learning and that we're all failing. And frankly, if you're not failing, you're not trying enough and that you're not brave enough. (laughs) But you've actually also cut community, which can help you during those periods because of all the reasons that you've already said, when you finally reconnected with that community, did you find that the stories that you told yourself were completely false oh, about yeah, they, what they thought of you? They didn't care. They didn't care in the slightest. <laughs> of course they didn't care. God, we're, and, humans are fascinating. Aren't we silly? And I remember, and we're talking about people that I'd been friends with since high school too. Like we're talking people I was really close to. And I remember talking to one of them, and this isn't that long ago to be truthful. And he's like, mate, he goes, I don't care. He goes, whatever works for you works for me. He goes, if it doesn't, if that's the best thing for you to do, he said, that's what I thought at the time. If that's the best thing for you to do, well, that's the best thing for you to do. He goes, he goes, you're good at what you do. You look after your clients. You're a good friend. What happened? And so, and so obviously, oh, you don't learn those things. We get wiser in retrospect, don't we? Not at the time. Mm. So, but it was a really good, you know, it's that, it was a really good lesson for me of that ultimately it's, it's not where you work. It's not who you work for. It's not whether you're self-employed. It's not what car you drive. It's just, well, are you a decent person? Do you do you do a good job? Can you look yourself in the mirror every morning and go, yeah, I'm, you know, I think I'm doing okay. And that's ultimately what it gets back to. We wrap so much worth around things that, frankly, are silly, so silly, and it's so interesting. And I guess why I'm really, like, drilling down on this is because, Charlie, you and I know that <laughs> – we're not alone in this when we're talking about ego and shame and stories that we've made for ourselves. Like there's people who are listening have probably generated stories that are also untrue, that they probably also need to overcome and unpack and think, well, is that my ego or is that the, is that the truth? And is that my worth and who I am as a human 
or am I much more than that? Because we do put all these markers of success as completely external validations of who we are. Yeah. And you build a business now inside of larger business, which is going really well, which we're going to come to and huge congrats, but it has longevity, which was the structural problem. So you've actually succeeded because you fixed the thing that was holding you back. Oh, that's right. And it's, and we haven't just fixed it in that we've been able to use the scale that working for a large organization brings and expand the services out. So, you know, yes, we still do the personal injury work and yes, it's still significant part of my practice, but in terms of our total practice now, it's, you know, it's probably only a quarter of, of the new client work we do. And yet the work that we have expanded out into, so we really, we've broken our practice down into two, is that we do a lot of work with people whose wealth is going to outlive them. That's mm. the way that we look at it. And the other part of it is we work with families who have, have experienced an adverse life event and they've got big financial decisions they have to make, but they need to be in the right headspace to make them. And so we've been able to expand that practice out to well beyond personal injury. So now we're working with people who've had cancer diagnoses, sudden bereavements, family, you know, people who've come out of bad marriages, like so many areas in which people have been left damaged isn't the right word, but who are traumatized from something that's happened to them. And we've been able to put a whole practice around it. So what we realized for was what we're solving for is not people who've had a really catastrophic injury. Like that's the super pointy end. We've built a practice where you go, actually, if you put people in front of people who are empathy first and then problem solving second, gee, that's almost everybody. <laughs> and that's what surprised that's what surprised us more than anything is is like when we work with business owners, like I've got a few clients who are almost like I've got a couple of clients who are like ASX listed CEOs and the conversations are almost exactly the same. Different as as for my families who have a severely disabled child. Like they obviously they're completely different. But at the at the nub of it they're exactly the same. What do you think advisors can learn about how to bring this concept of true well-being assistance into advice? Yeah, it's it's difficult. I sort of feel like, if I can say this, I feel like the term well-being has probably been a little bit co-opted in that everything has to be well-being driven now. Okay, do you got a better uh, word? I don't know. It's almost like I feel like I liked it before it was cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was the cool kid first. <laughs> Look, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest, um, because it is, you know, we all, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, a firm which has on their website, we act with honesty and integrity. It's like, well, what else are you going to put on your website that you don't? Mm. Um, and I think there's just an element of caring about people's well-being. If you're a good professional, regardless of what, what profession you're in, it should be at the core of what, what we do. Mm. Like good doctors are the ones who genuinely care about the person that's sitting in front of them. They don't care about what's on the report that they're looking at. Like that's the differentiator between a good professional and and just a you know what I'd say a stock standard professional. So because yeah, we the- all want to be good at well being or whatever the non cool cool word word is for it, but like uh, you know I I see tremendous opportunity for us to do it better because. As you rightly point out, irrespective of what's happened in someone's life, whether they've had a big T or a small T or whatever, you know, most people have got a story. Most people have got trauma. Most people have had generational trauma and they come up in and that's impacting how they think about risk or money or whatever. So there's obviously a financial component to it, but we aren't equipped to be able to host some of the conversations that people want to have with us. Mm. And I'm interested to understand, like, do you have an allied health sort of referral program or like how do you specifically bring well-being into what you do now so we've still got so we have we've changed the role slightly i mean what was previously a well-being advocate role is now what we call a well-being relationship manager so we've changed that role ever so slightly and and so the lady that's working with us now, she's got a background in disability, in healthcare. She's done work with NDIS. So she's done everything from being a carer right through to running teams and helping people obtain employment, all of those type of things. And so that's a service for some of our clients. It's an everyday. But for a lot of our clients, say if you look at the other side of our practice, the the families who don't really have any need for it on a day-to-day basis, the point being from our our point of view is is that that's a service that somebody might only need once, but you also get 
those times where your client rings and I, and I have that client, he, he rings and he said, look, my mum's just being diagnosed with dementia. What the hell do I do now? And so I just went, right, I just talk to Davina, the ladies that's working with us, just talk to Davina and we'll just work it out. And she, her job's not to solve the problem, it's just to help them unpack it and then go, okay, go here, do this, do that, do this, do that. And that person hasn't needed her since. It was probably mm. a one week where he where she helped him. But, you know, he has referred so many people afterwards because his point being, as he said to people, he said, go and talk to these guys because they're really good with your money and it doesn't really matter what life throws at you, they'll help, they can help. And and so that for me is the well being bit is is where you can genuinely say, I don't necessarily have the answers for you for what's going on, but we as I sometimes describe, we run towards the things that that most advisors run away from, which is we're not we want to know. And I mean, we got people they pay us a lot of money and it's it's incumbent upon us to care, is probably the way I describe it. And I think for people who go through something that is really stressful, particularly if something's been diagnosed or there's been an accident or something occurs or someone dies, the level of overwhelm is huge. And to even have someone tell you things that logically you should know, like you need to call this person, you need to think about this, like our brains aren't working in a normal way when those things occur. And so to have someone on call or to give you a roadmap and say, right, this might not be exhaustive, but here's the things that I think you should go and do. The level of psychological comfort that there's someone there who's specifically going to make sure I don't miss anything. I yeah. think that that's huge and really rare, Charlie, in our world. Yeah, look, I think it, it it is quite rare, sadly, but it is that, as you said, and that next step to go beyond that, which is to go, what can I take off your plate? And I, I'm not equipped to have, I'm, I can have those conversations and I've got an enormous amount of empathy, but, but that's not my training. Mm. It is the ability to go, okay, I've got empathy with your situation, but how do we turn that into action that's helpful for you? And you mm. don't have to be a practice like ours where you have someone dedicated in-house. It's just about, you know, be the person that knows a person, which is mm. if somebody tells you that something's going on, just go, well, how can I solve that? How can I help them solve that? And we're staring down the barrel of more people aging than sort of ever before. So if you aren't thinking about this in your practice and you work with older people, it's just a matter of time before you get that call and you just perhaps don't have the right connections or the right thing to say to that person and then they realise you're not the person to call if things yeah, like that happen. that's exactly right. And ultimately mm. I think that, you know, from a financial planning point of view, the financial management of, of money is, you know, we can, we can all kid ourselves as to how important we are and how much value we can add from a portfolio point of view, but largely it's – it's getting pretty close to being commoditized. And so if we want to, in our practices, continue to charge the kind of fees that we did in the past, the, you know, the, the, the puppet show of, of moving money around and being super active and trying to pretend that we can add value that way, it's been so comprehensively debunked mm. that I don't think that that's a successful way to build a practice. And I remember when a long time ago taking – my, because well, the, the firm I came from was a super active house, and then when I set up my own practice, you know, we hit upon this e- you know, evidence-based investing and asset class investing and all of those kind of things that come with it. And explaining that to my wife at the time, and she said, "Well, that's great, but what do the clients need you for?" And so that's actually the key, which is, well, what are you going to do if you're not pulling the puppet strings all the time with the investments? How do you add value? And so really, then having to dive in to think, okay, well. We're not we're not actually solving a problem if we if we're doing portfolio management all the time. So what what problems are we actually solving for people? And and that was really the key. And the reason I ended up with Shadforth is because they're an evidence based investment house, cash flow driven, long term driven. And you know, as our CEO says, we're in the business of making fifty year promises and keeping them. Mm. And that's why I'm so comfortable, even though it's in one sense. You could argue you lose freedom by moving into an institute, back into an institutional framework from your own practice, but it depends on what your lens is. My lens is, I can I can look these people in the eye and go, there will still be somebody here in fifty years to look after you. It won't be me, but there will still be somebody here. But making sure that that informs every single element of the way we run our practice. Is it a big misconception that a larger practice, like what were you thinking? you were going to walk into when you joined a larger practice? Did you feel like you were going to lose all your autonomy? Did you feel like your ideas were just going to be put on a shelf for that to-do list that doesn't happen? Like what misconceptions did you have about walking back into a bigger business? Oh, look, I think that the answer is not a lot, 
like I, I went in with my eyes open and, mm. you know, in credit to to Shadforth as a firm is, you know, do they have a very defined investment philosophy? Yes, they do. But it's an open architecture firm. We have to provide advice to the clients that's in their best interest, you know, as we all do. But as that, when that comes down to investments you put forward and platforms you use and all those kind of things, like we had ultimate freedom. There were really no restrictions in that regard. Uh, the way Shadforth worked it was go, look, this is what we've what we've got. We've put together, we've used our scale to keep the costs down as much as we can. We want to make that as attractive as we can for our advisors to use, but you got to do what's in the best interest of the client. And so I didn't have any concerns about that. The only, it wasn't a misconception. The only concern I had was going into a large organization was how do I keep, because my practice was, as you said, a little bit niche, how do I keep that differentiation in the market, do I lose? Do I lose my branding, which makes me different, and therefore my offering then to the external market becomes weaker? Because Shadforth do a bit of this work. There's a really good advisor in Sydney who does similar work to me. Um, so we had they had a heritage in it, but not probably to the degree that I brought with me, and not as targeted as what I was doing. So they were they were my concerns. Mm-hmm. But honestly, it was. The there really weren't it really it to be frank with you it really I did slot in the practice slotted in so perfectly Shad Fulth was so accommodating to me going you do like you're in it the, the things you're doing for your client are super important you do whatever's right we're not going to question you on how, what you do how you do it what you charge you know your practice you go run it and so it was ultimately flexible that they were it was me fighting them. To be honest, for the first couple of years, purely because it was me still trying to hang on to my independence, mm. for want of a better term, and the and the shadows of what was left of what I built, and so mm. it took me a long time to let that go, and so I fought them a bit, but they were magnificent to me and and remain so. Bless them. So you've been able to build what I would consider wildly con- successful business within the business. Can we talk a little bit about what that looks like today? So the practice that we've got is, and I think you talk about, you know, why do I have, why am I so happy to be here is two years ago, Shadforth approached me because we have a hundred odd advisors around the, around the country and we all operated individually really as silos. And they came to me and said, look, we're thinking of moving to more of a team based partnership model. We want to set one of these up in Queensland. Would you be prepared to run one? And one of the benefits of a team based model is, 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 there's a limit to how many clients you can look after on your own. and But I wasn't at that point. I wasn't heaving at the seams. We were growing quickly, but I was still operating really well. So I didn't really need that scale. But what it was was an opportunity to work with some advisors in the office, bring us together and to create A, a succession plan for all of us, but also just that concept of being able to come to work and be part of a team, which for us as advisors, it's, it can be a pretty lonely business because you really are, you know, still a one man band. And so when we set that up, we had, there was a gentleman who has since retired. He came in because he wanted to transition his clients across to us over the next couple of years because he liked the concept of, of what our practice was about. There was another lady, Rhiannon, who interestingly, I was pretty excited about. She's just been announced in the financial standard. Is it the Power 50? So mm-hmm. I think she's just been announced in that, which is great. And she and I. Welcome, Rhiannon. Yeah, so she and I had been working together. She really liked the concept of what we did and she'd had an experience with a client who'd been spat out pretty badly in life and loved it. And so there was an opportunity for her to come in and work with us and and develop her practice along similar lines and, and another client and another advisor, Michael, and we all came together and it's taken us a few years. We've got another advisor now, but we've really, really hit our straps in the last probably 18 months. Um, you know, we've got a really, we've got a really big practice now. Like we're, I think, obviously, FUM's not the be all and end all, but we're probably managing a tick under about a billion dollars, and you know, it's a, it's a big practice, and, and that's super gratifying because we take that approach, which is we genuinely, you know, obviously everybody says it, but we genuinely care about our clients, and, and it's the conversations that we come to work for. It's not the moving money around and doing the financial modelling. That's great, but that's. That's just what we've got to do as par. How are you feeling? Well, interestingly, these are the t- as you said, these are the times where you've got to force yourself to take a step back and 
actually acknowledge and reflect on where I am now. And when I look at what caused me to leave my original firm all of those years ago was really what I wanted. I probably didn't articulate it and I didn't know, but what I wanted is what I have, which I just want to be able to come to work. I want to have freedom to innovate, but it doesn't mean I need to own it. There's a big difference. Like you can have ownership without owning it. And, but I want the ability to know that I can go on holidays and not look at my phone and know that the clients are going to be better off for it probably because I've got some really capable people in our team that are much smarter than me. And also too, to have a plan where I go, I can see what the next 15 or 20 years looks like and it looks really good. And do you get to sleep rather than overthinking in the middle of the night? Is that part of the plan? I am a bit of a solution looking for a problem sometimes in that I always find something to spin my wheels over. But when you actually take a step back and you're like, really, that's that's actually what you're worried about? It's 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 the it's the law of diminishing returns, isn't it? Like, I, yes, I still beat myself up about things, but in in the reality, they're not existential at all. They're just they're all just the little things around the margins. Like, how do you get how do you do this for your kids? How do I do this? How do I do that? What am I going to do here? All those kind of things. But they but they're just hygiene things, really. That that I worry about now. They're not big picture things. We've talked a lot today about I, I guess the concept of what is failing and what is succeeding. And when you hear your story, Charlie, you've succeeded because you've been a- <laughs> <laughs> No, no, you've succeeded. You've built a business that has longevity. You've remained able to continue to look after a niche, albeit it might be a smaller percentage, but you haven't lost your identity or your core about who you want to serve. You've created freedom financially for you, I would imagine. You've created capacity to still be in a team and innovate. You aren't having existential crises conversations with yourself at three o'clock in the morning about your business and the risk and the sheer weight of running the thing, which is overwhelming. I don't know about you, but I think that that is enormously successful. You have more balance as well, right? Oh yeah, well I have. There is balance. Previously, there was no balance, and and also too, it is. It it depends on how you measure success, and and like I come from a family of self employment. My dad and his two brothers run a really big business, and you know my old man was a five to nine man. Five in the morning till nine at night, and we just didn't ever see him. And it's taken me until my forties to have a really good relationship with him. Mm. And just like that is that is not happening. And if mm. I have to trade away a bit of my ego or potentially what I might be able to do in my career to have the relationship with my kids at fifteen that I've got with my dad now at forty five, well, I'll do that. And but the beautiful thing is 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 that okay, I've lost the what might be the outward trappings of being successful because I think the ultimate measure is of success is you've got your own business and it's your own brand and you're killing it. Like that's you know, that's probably the highest the highest level of success. But by the metrics that matter to me, extraordinarily more successful than I would have been if I had a state of my business. I think many people listening today are going to be really sincerely thinking about what they believe is truly successful, not in the eyes of other people, but for themselves and actually working out whether the story that they're telling themselves is serving their life and if they need to park their ego and make some big business decisions that are going to help their clients and help them live better. So I want to say a huge thank you for sharing a very personal story and for being vulnerable. We're not very good at doing this stuff. It's hard. It's really hard to get up on a platform and say, this didn't work and this didn't feel good and this is how I reacted and this was hard. And so um, I I need to say very clearly that I'm grateful to hear your story and I know many others will be too. So before we round out with some of my rapid fire questions, thank you again. And if people want to learn more about you, how shall they find you, dear Charlie? I'm sure if you Google my name, I'll come up. But um, LinkedIn's always the easiest way to find me. Or I'm sure if you go to the, if you type in my name, I'll come up on Shadforth website, and you you can find me that way. And and it is. This sounds a little bit wanky, but I, I had the fortune of doing some study in the states. It was only a short course, but mm. some study in the states quite a few years ago. And one of the things they talked about, and it's very American, but they talked about this concept of the social contract, which mm-hmm. is. If you're in a privileged position, which, you know, let's face it, I've had 
like that previous firm I worked with, they invested in me so heavily and I was so grateful for them for doing that. And so I've had so many opportunities that other people haven't had and that concept of if you're in a privileged, in a privileged position and if, if you're in a position to help people and if somebody asks you, then you're, you're obliged to do so. And again, you know, it sounds a little bit wanky, but that's the way I operate is that I'll, I will try and help people as much as I can because, you know, I don't have all the answers. I might have no answers, but I certainly have learned a little bit about what not to do. <laughs> so um, That's a lovely invitation for anyone that might be sitting with some of the problems that you've talked about today. So thank you for potentially offering up some of your time and space to hold conversations Thanks, that we might not want to have. Uh, are you ready for rapid fire questions? I think so. You're a bit stressed about these. Let's see how you go. <laughs> First question to you is what is one thing that you do to look after your mental health? Speak. Hmm. If I can just elaborate on that. Please is, do. I'm often the last to know what is wrong with me and it's not until I uh, actually start speaking that it finally comes out what's going on inside my head. So I have a rule, well, my wife has a rule where it's pretty obvious if things aren't going well inside my head. So she just sits me down and she just says, talk, and she just shuts up. And it takes me ages, but eventually it'll just spill out. And so that's the key for me is 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 to focus on okay, there's something going on inside here. I don't know what it is. Just start talking and find it. Yeah, and 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 the thing I do, the little game I play with myself is why do you have to wait a week before this happens? Just just say the first word. So that's sort of the thing I do is as soon as I'm not something's bothering me, just like okay, I don't know what it is. Start talking. So that's, I'd like to say I do lots of things like yoga and exercise, but I chase my kids around, so I I don't create time for those things. There is no right or wrong here. And I think many people would like to or need to actually just be in tune with what's going on inside their body and being Mm. able to articulate it and communicate it in a safe way. I think that's extraordinarily powerful. Um, Is there a piece of advice that you would give to young Charlie? Depends how far back you go, but... Mm -hmm. I think it's that have a crack is probably not the right word, but I, mean, I spent a lot of my childhood just not getting involved in things for fear of drawing attention to yourself or thinking you're going to look stupid or whatever it might be. And I see that in my son now. I've got one son who's glorious in the sense that he'll try anything and I've got my other elder son who's very much like me and you can just see him withdraw from things and you're like, mate, just, just have a go. Don't worry about it. Pick whatever you can that you're crap at and go and have a crack at it. Like that would be the advice. Talk to people more, ask more questions. Mm, and be brave. What is something that is on your bucket list? Well, I had to think about this. Mm. Um, I haven't afforded myself a bucket list yet, but one of the things I'd love to do is being a redhead, I live in a country that's trying to kill me. The and- same. Preach. <laughs> <laughs> and- <laughs> And so I did a DNA test years ago and before I realized I was giving my DNA away to some company. And Mm -hmm. one thing I learned that the vast majority of my heritage is from a very small space, very small place in Scotland. And I want to go back there and just to see whether or not I have that feeling. I remember listening to Jonathan Thurston, a footballer who grew up in Sherberg, but that's not what that's that's not his country and he talked about the first time when he went back to his country and he said it just had this feeling for him he's like this is this is me and i just think i think it just would be fascinating for for me to go back to that space and just stand there and just go do i have that feeling like is this is this me or is it not Mm. Um, Mm. so i'm just it probably won't be it also helps that that's where probably 10 of the best golf courses in the world are so that's that's helpful it's a good plan B. And plan C yeah. is you just go to the pub and start talking to people because you're probably a distant relative to half of the town. <laughs> Every chance. There's a castle Every there with my name on it. This is win-win, Charlie. You have to do this. You need to do Indeed. this soon. Yep. You nailed it. You were a bit worried about the bucket list question. I think you did very well. My last question for you is that I have a fake book club and I would love to know if you have a recommendation for a book to add to my fake book club list. I have three. Oh, my gosh. Hold on. Yes. Okay, go. So the first one is Boy Swallows Universe by Trent Dalton. Okay. Um, so he's he's Brisbane. He's a Brisbane-based author. He used to write all of the human interest pieces for the Australian magazine. Okay. And and I've had the I've had the sort of the good fortune of just getting to know him a little bit, and that is one of the most 
fantastic books you could ever possibly read. His writing style is amazing. The other one is that's written by Richard Flanagan called The Narrow Road to the Deep North. Okay. It's brutal, um, but it's I'm a bit of a history buff, so it's it's written set in the Second World War, large sort of based based partly I believe on his grandfather and then partly on Weary Dunlop. So it talks a lot of the Japanese POW camps and fascinating story. Mm. Um, and the other one I just read, which is the book that won the Miles Franklin, which is um, Bodies of Light, which is a story of. I can't remember the author, I'm sorry, um, is the story of a woman who grows up in pretty difficult circumstances and just follows her life. And it's, it is a fascinating read. It's a great book. I'd highly recommend that book. Very good. Okay. The, the most stressful thing, obviously, about doing a weekly podcast where you ask for book recommendations and where someone puts three book recommendations into one week is the stress of how will I finish all of these books. But I do my damnedest. And people... You know what's interesting, Charlie? People message me and they're like, thank you so much. I actually read one of the books that blah, blah said and it was really good. So I feel less responsibility to need to have read all of them yeah. in a short space of time because I know that the community is reading along yeah. with us. And do you, want a, do you want a wanky self-help book as well? Oh, go for your life. Let's do four. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the best wanky self-help book I ever read was, it's called How Will You Measure Your Life by Clayton Christensen. Mm. And again, when I went to that, study in the States, he was one of the professors that was there. And I got talking to him about this whole concept of there's got to be more to wealth management than just managing people's money. And he said, oh, have a read of this book. It might be interesting. And, and ultimately, the way that comes down to is, is is measure your life by the success of your career as opposed to your job, the depth of relationship with your family and friends and the degree to which you will live a life of integrity. And they're the three things. And it it really resonated with me. I loved it. And so I've given that book to a lot of people. I think that that is a really good summation, actually, of everything that we've talked about today. So on behalf of the entire XY community, I think we should use that as our closing piece and say, thank you so much for being part of today's chat. Thanks, Jess. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for the opportunity. 